So, Father, thank you for John, and uh, thank you for the word of God. And we pray that it would bear fruit today, that it would change us, that we wouldn't just be hearing the word, but we would be opening up our hearts, that it would affect our lives and affect our decisions and our priorities. So bless him and speak to him and through him. And I speak a special blessing also for those who've, who are listening online and on YouTube. Bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. It's great to have so many guests today. We're glad you're here. We are in a series, if you can pull that up, Daniel, on, we call it Missions Month, and so we've had someone talk about their missions trip to Poland, and we had a missions team go to Croatia, and they spoke about that trip, and then we had a Czech missionary who thought he was called to China, and God ended up landing him in Thailand, and he shared about his ministry there. So it's mostly been testimonies, and... I kind of, as a pastor, I kind of felt I need to do a little teaching as well. So uh, this is the teaching aspect of that. But at the end, we're going to have a couple of testimonies uh, from people in our community uh, who have ministries here in the Czech Republic and answering the question, you know, what brought you to the Czech Republic? I mean, you could have gone anywhere in the world. Why here? So... Um, <clears throat> I have a very short testimony about why I'm here. And for me, it started as a young man who went to a missions conference. And truth be told, the reason I went to the missions conference is the seminary that I was attending, which was Dallas Theological Seminary, they had a booth at the missions conference, and they were offering students free airfare if they would go help out in the booth. And I thought, this is a great chance to go visit my aunt and uncle who live in that same town in Urbana, Champaign, uh, Illinois. And the name of the conference is Urbana. And ironically, many of you know Garth, but Garth and Kelsey both attended the same conference. Not the same year. It's every three years they have a, this conference called Urbana. It's a missions conference. The whole focus is missions. And <clears throat> during that conference, I responded and stood and made a personal commitment that I would serve the Lord for at least two years in missions work. Anybody ready? Like, why? To be honest, I can't remember all the details. <laughs> but my best recollection is I was both inspired and convicted by God's word. Because my Lord, your Lord, Jesus Christ was the first missionary. He left home in heaven and came to a foreign mission field. And I just wanted to follow him and his footsteps. So the next logical question is, what was Jesus' mission? Why did he come here? To earth. Now, I often do like interactive sermons, so you're welcome to chime in. Why do you think Jesus came here? What was his mission? It, and it has to be scripturally based, not just my opinion. To buy us back, to redeem us. Good. To reconcile man to God. In fact, that's 1 Timothy 2.5. There is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity. The man Jesus Christ. What else you got? Yes. He came to do the will of his Father. And what was the will of his Father? All men could be redeemed. 
Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who thought they were righteous. Seek and save who? The lost, yeah. 1 John 3.5, You know that Jesus came to take away sin. 1 Timothy 1.15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So what was Jesus' mission? Not of giving you the answers. To save the world. He came to reconcile man with God by taking away their sin. That was the mission. The next question is, who? Who is called to this mission? Anybody have any ideas about that one? John 20, 21 says, As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Who's the you? Well, the context was the disciples, so you could say the disciples. But Paul reminds the church in Corinth, I don't think it was just for that particular church, I think it applies for all the churches because it was put in Scripture. He says, so we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us, right? We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. So, who's the who? Us. We are the ambassadors. We are the ones speaking for Christ. And I think that's a really strong argument for that every believer is expected and called into this mission of Christ, right? This mission of reconciliation. So, I'm on here, guys. Maybe I should point at the, there we go. <clears throat> but I know that many believers would claim that they don't have the ability or the power to bring sinners back to God. They just can't do it in their own strength. But I think Apostle Peter had a different idea when he wrote uh, these words here from 1 Peter 4, verses 10 and 11. So, Carolyn, can I call on you to read that? This is going to be our text for today. 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use these, manage, steward them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. 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 So what this says is that all of us are equipped and empowered by God to carry out this mission. Now, does anybody have any excuses left? I don't think so. But, you know, the reality is, why is it that the church doesn't reflect this passage? Why do you think that is? I mean, typically, in any given church, there's only a small percentage of people who are actually engaged in the mission. What do you think is going on? Well, obviously, it's more fun to watch him do it than me do it. <laughs> but today, I want to provoke you to love and good deeds, as Hebrews says. I want to motivate you to a missions mindset, a missions attitude, and even a missions lifestyle. All right, so these are going to be my points for today. 
Typically they say you can only handle three, but I know that you are so smart that this group can handle four points to remember. All right? So I'm going to quickly give some uh, support for each one of these and then we'll get to the testimonies. But before I do that, I just want to point out that there's two things that can get confused, okay? Now there is receiving the gift, which is singular, of the Holy Spirit, right? And then there's receiving the gifts, which is plural, from the Holy Spirit. What Peter's talking about in this verse that we just read was from the Holy Spirit, okay? Everybody got that? And you can find out more about these gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, and Ephesians chapter 4, right? And these gifts are the tools that we need to carry out this mission. Everybody got that? All right, so let's go to number one. Gifts are for all believers. Can I call on someone to read the 1 Corinthians and the Ephesians passages? The last one we've already read. So, Bella, you're so close. I... Sorry, which ones? The first two. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Ephesians 4, 7. However, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. Amen. So I want everyone to repeat after me. Ready? God has given me gifts. Very good. All of these passages and what you just confessed, it's past tense. Right? It's already happened. It's settled. Like it's it's not up for negotiation. It's already happened, and it's there. They may be undiscovered. They may be latent. They may be even unknown. But according to God's word, they're already there, right? Now, is there anybody that's kind of curious about what are my gifts? What are the gifts the Holy Spirit has given to me? Anybody? There we have a brave, honest man. <laughs> well, the honest thing I can tell you, Steve, is that discovering the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given to each one of us is our own personal responsibility. Like, you're not going to stand before God and say, well, Pastor John never told me. That's not going to fly, all right? <clears throat> and I have some good news because almost every year we have another gifts course, and it's typically in the autumn. And guess what's coming up this autumn? A gifts course to help you discover what your spiritual gifts are. Okay, anybody remember um, Susan Boyle, who was on the Britain's Got Talent? Oh, yeah. Now, I'm pretty sure someone had told her that she has a singing talent. Okay? I'm not sure that she really believed that or had the full reality of that until she got up on that stage. Right? She got up on that stage and started singing, and she knew. 100%. And in a similar way for us, like you can take a gift test we have on our online book, you know, depository on Google Drive. We have several gift tests. But honestly, the best way to discover your gift, spiritual gifts is to start doing spiritual service. The, maybe you could say the only way, but I won't say that because God could speak from heaven and tell you, this is what it is. But for most people, we just start serving. So gifts of the Holy Spirit have a purpose, right? They're, they're not given for your personal edification. They're not given to build your ego or something like that. 
What are the, what's the purpose? To serve others, exactly. And, you know, if someone was to ask you to build a house, like commission you build a house, um, wouldn't it be nice if they gave you some tools to do that work? Yeah, it's going to be easier if you got a hammer and a saw, for instance. A few other tools would be helpful, right? In a similar way, to build the kingdom of God, we need tools. Well, it turns out, Scripture says, we already have been given tools. So, why would the Holy Spirit give us tools if we weren't expected to be builders? That would be like wasted resources. You've been given gifts of the Holy Spirit because God's plan for your life is to be on this mission and to extend the kingdom of God and to build the body of Christ, which is doing the same things. By reaching the lost and building the body of Christ. All right, I got to keep going. Number two, gifts are intended by God to be used. So, can I call on you, Henry, to read the first two verses? <clears throat> Romans 12, 6. In His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. In Ephesians 4, 16, He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow. So that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Thank you. So, quick question. Were you aware that using your gifts was not optional? According to Scripture. Like, if you really wanted to say, I'm an obedient follower of Christ, you would be using your gifts. I can't sugarcoat that, yeah? Not only that, but God expects you to do it well. He expects you to manage those gifts. And if you weren't using your gifts, what do you think that would look like for the body of Christ? Yeah, there wouldn't be a lot happening, right? And you wouldn't have a healthy community, nor would you have an effective community, right? And, you know, I go back that still many... Christians in our day, they expect the ministers to all do all the ministry and the lay people do all the laying back and watching what's going on, right? But that's not effective and that's not healthy. God intends you to use your spiritual gifts, but you know what? That is a big responsibility, but it's also a very big honor. You are invited to be a co-laborer with Christ. That means your life on this earth has value. It's important. It's a needed piece of God's will to be done on this earth. You are born for a reason. And this is first and foremost. Right, so to summarize, everyone's been given gifts to further Christ's mission. Everyone's expected to manage and steward their gifts well. And that implies developing your gifts and using them for Christ and His mission and not for your benefit. We're all good? All right, number three. Gifts are for equipping the church. Okay. Kelsey, can you see that far? Yeah, can you read the Ephesians verse? Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. Amen. And... If you read the whole first Peter chapter, you see that the, the context of serve one another, that's actually serving one another in the body of Christ. It's serving the body of Christ. So 
I don't know, this may or may not be a new revelation for you, um, but not only are gifts given to complete the mission, right? But they're also given to build the body of Christ, which is expressed through, obviously, local churches. And next question is like, why, why does God want to build the body of Christ? Why do you think? Why he wants to build? Yeah. In terms of this mission. He wants to include the whole body into this mission, right? And the fact is that the, the church is a very effective model for the mission. Like inviting people in to the presence of God, uh, inviting people in to, you know, study God's word, uh, inviting people in to uh, meet um, to meet other believers. Like a lot of times we came here, that was the big first step was just to make friends with the Czech person and let him know that you're not weird. <laughs> For some, it worked better than others. <laughs> I, I was more on the normal side. Doesn't mean everyone is. But collectively, we're normal. We're nice. We're good. We're loving. It's all good. So, not only is the church a good place for this mission of reaching the lost, uh, but the church is actually a great place for discipling those who come in and helping them mature into who God created them to be and to steering them towards the mission that they're supposed to be on, right? It's also a great place, this thing we call church, to develop our spiritual gifts. Like, you're not going to start out at Sam's position. You'll probably start out in a home group, leading worship in a small group, and develop your gifts. And right, you probably start teaching a lesson at your small group before you're up here preaching one. So, God's plan, not mine. I do want to point out, if you, if you read the books, book of Acts, um, God did not save anyone without, at the same time, adding them to the church, right? And no one was added to the church who also didn't get saved, right? Both happened. They were added to the church and added to the Lord. So when you get baptized, one aspect is a new birth in a spiritual community of faith. And most denominations have that theology. That to be baptized, you're not just baptized into the universal body of Christ, but you're baptized into a local community of faith. And you can say that's the first step in discipleship, is when you get baptized. I would say the second step in discipleship is discovering and start using your spiritual gifts. Right? And again, today's culture is more like uh, you stay seated down there, right? You can pray, you can pay, but stay out of the way. Like no one actually gets up and says that. But in many churches, that's the, like the culture. Professional people do the professional work, and the non-professional people just sit and watch. But that's not what the Bible says. We're all priests in God's house. We're all ministers in God's house. And maybe we have different ministries, but we're all on the same team with the same mission. And each member of the team is just as important as the next member. There are no favorites in the kingdom of God. All glory goes to Christ. And... You know, can you imagine a body? And the head works fine, but from the shoulders down, it's just paralyzed. It's not doing anything. Is that a healthy body? No. It's alive, right? But it's not going to be effective. 
That is not God's will for the church. Okay, last point. Gift ministry brings God's glory. So I'll read 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11 again. I paraphrased. Use your gifts well to serve one another. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever. So have you ever considered that not using your gifts is robbing God of his glory? The glory that's due to him. You know, if you think about it, everything that you do brings glory to God, right? Everything you do with the gifts of the Holy Spirit brings glory to God. Then not using your gifts brings less glory to God. Yeah? There's many ways we can use our gifts to glorify God. Uh, for instance, some serve in the church, like Daniel doing projection, or Justin doing the cameras, or Leslie doing the sound. Um, some serve through the church, like the mission team that just went to Croatia. They were sent out. Or some people have... Uh, Ministries alongside the church, like Cindy and Carolyn. She'll talk about that in a minute. And then some serve beyond the church. Like we have quite a few missionaries, there's a picture out there of the, the different missionaries that were part of our community that are now out on mission, and we support them monthly. And all of these glorify God. <clears throat> so when God is revealed, it glorifies him. Everybody agree with that, right? And God is glorified when we use our gifts. There we go. So all of that's going to bring glory to God. And, you know, sometimes we're thinking, oh, I wish I could sense God's presence. Oh, I want to be in God's presence. Well, what does it require for a spiritual gift to be at work? Who has to be there doing the work? The Holy Spirit, right? So whenever the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are in operation, God is present because he's doing that work in you and through you. So if you want to be in God's presence, operate out of your spiritual gifts. And you will be in God's presence. Okay, so wrapping it up. Told you it would be quick. <clears throat> gifts are for all believers. Gifts are intended by God to be used. Gifts are for equipping the church. And gift ministry brings glory to God. So I'll go back to the original question, which was, why does the practice of the church not match the theology of the evangelical church? I don't know the statistics here, but in America, it's about 70-30. Meaning, 30% of the church community are using their gifts and 70% are not. Any thoughts? Well, one possibility is the attitude of the leadership of the church. Like, if the church sees the community as, let's say, customers rather than disciples, they're going to miss the mark. And the other side of it is the community, if they see themselves as spectators rather than participants, they're going to miss the mark. But what I say is, that's exactly why we need missions. Why we need this mission. And the reason I say that is, missions, in my opinion, move us into an intimate relationship with Christ. Okay? I'll give you an example. If you view yourself as a spectator... You can get by with God in a book, okay? But if you want to be operating out of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, 
Like, if you want God to be working in you, alongside of you, and through you, you need more than a God in a book. You need a God who's alive. And that's what service does. When we step out and lay our lives down for God, we become more and more intimate with Him. He becomes more and more alive in our hearts. Missions is the key to intimacy. We cannot do it. We cannot do this mission work without Him alive in our hearts. You can't just play along. You need God. That's why we all need to serve. So, in conclusion, the who is obviously you. You and I are the ones who need to serve. And again, Jesus' mission is to send you into the world to save sinners. His mission is now our mission, or missions, right? Like, there's as many ways to do mission as there are, you know, parts to the body. He didn't say how it was going to look when we go out to save sinners, right? But he did say, I am sending you. You will save sinners. You will help reconcile people to God. And final thing I would say that, you know, there's a few who are called to mass evangelism, like, for instance, Paul or Reinhard Bonnke or someone, right? But many, many are called to personal evangelism, like Philip witnessing to the Ethiopian guy. But I would go as far as to say that all are called to local church evangelism, like Aquila and Priscilla. You can read that in Acts. They just invited people into their home or small group fellowships. I believe that all of us are called to that ministry. Not just inviting people to this Sabbath synagogue thing that we do called Sunday worship, but also inviting them into the small groups that we're a part of. Or literally into our homes. Invite people over for dinner. Right? So it's going to look different ways for different people, but it all begins with someone who hears Christ's call. Someone who understands Christ's mission. And someone who says, here I am, Lord. Send me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and the instruction that it gives us and teaches us we thank you that it puts us on the right path. It, it puts us in the center of your will. And Lord, I pray for every person here that they would uh, live their life in the center of your will. And I pray, Lord, that uh, the Holy Spirit would come alongside each and every person and make that a natural, easy step. Lord, sometimes we make things too complicated in our heads or we have barriers that are just not barriers. So I pray for the Holy Spirit to come and just to release truth. The truth that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The truth that I can serve in the strength that you supply truth that the Holy Spirit resides in us and works through us. Here we are, Lord. Use us in many, many different ways, but use us for this mission. In Jesus' name, amen.
So online, in one of the earlier PCF posts, there's my testimony. So you can find it and read it. And, um, but I want to hear, with the little time that we have left, I want to hear from you, yes, and Leslie. We're going to be patient, just keep it short. Okay, good morning. <clears throat> well, um, I'm not quite sure. I met Avery this morning, and um, I said, why don't you get up and give my testimony? Because what she told me sounded very much like my testimony, and that is, unfortunately, I sat on the sidelines. Um, I did... I, I did God's work. I was married to a pastor. I went to all the meetings. I did the prayer groups. But um, I, I was doing rather than being. And when I learned to be with the Holy Spirit and spent my time with Him, He came to me at 4 o'clock in the morning uh, in April of 2015 and he told me to come to this country he said I want you to go and you will work for me and I will provide everything you need and uh, we came uh, I came my my ministry partner Cindy Riley she had already prepared me by teaching me how to walk by faith and it's a dramatic walk it gives you everything everything you need can come from our Heavenly Father so he wants us to walk he wants us to use our gifts he began uh, showing me gifts that I didn't know I had I thought I had oh a gift of compassion a gift of uh, some teaching but he gave me the gift of visions and he showed me pictures of where we were going when uh, different things that we've done in our lives and you're compelled when you hear from the maker of the universe and he asks you to do something you can do none other and the people here are worth every minute and sacrifice of leaving home and family for God's glory not mine it's not not to make me happy or feel comfortable it's for him praise God so I think when I came here I was 23 or 24 and of course I grew up in a Christian family always existed in the safe bubble but then my faith wasn't really tested because like I said on Wednesday you might just be thinking faith is uh, what you need to receive from God but actually faith is what proves your character in God and your character as a believer so that was never tested until I think I was because normally I'm a musician so I sing so I was ministering somewhere and the pastor was like I saw you ministering this place and of course I didn't know much about the country so I read about it I was like, okay, Czechoslovakia, now Czech. And then I came. And of course, my first thought after one week was like, oh Lord, why? Because the first check I said, hello to good morning, can you show me? It was like, I don't speak English. I'm like, but that was English, no? It was quite cold and of course, Two weeks after I was regretting my decision, I didn't understand my mission yet. Because one thing I found out through the process is that the devil is not afraid that you're being called. But he becomes afraid when he understands that you now know the reason for your mission. When you understand your mission, then he's afraid of you. Because you're now a man of understanding and knowledge. And over time, I came to find out why the Lord sent me here. Why this place? Why not somewhere in Split, Croatia, where I could enjoy the sun and, you know, the ocean and the, and the fish? And of course, the second thing I found out here was the ungodliness. 
yeah, it was so ungodly. A uh, young man, it was easy to be tempted. But then I saw how through everything, the call was for the people, but it was also for me to prove myself in Christ, for my faith to be tested, for me to move into a greater place of understanding in God. And of course I came to see that meanwhile everybody says this place is an ungodly nation. It was where I truly discovered my living God. It was where I truly discovered who I am in God and my faith in Christ. It was where I truly discovered my purpose was to bring fire to the people of God. And I saw every time I went through the city and the country, I saw it was to draw these people that were like me to him. And over time I saw as my life unraveled in him that it was to bring more people close to him, to reveal Christ to more people. And I came to see why God chose this nation for me was that it was a dark place that needed a light that still needs the light so maybe you're here you don't understand yet I pray the Lord reveals to you and he teaches you and you get to understand your mission also thank you thank you Amen. let's all stand Kelsey's going to lead us in prayer to close so one thing I've been meditating on this week is um, from John 4 and there was a story in the Bible where um, Jesus' disciples were concerned about him because he apparently wasn't eating. So they're like, hey, you know, take some food. And Jesus said, um, uh, it's what, what our sister here said earlier about doing the will, right? He said, uh, my food or my nourishment um, comes from doing the will of the Father. And then he talked about, you know, I have food you don't know anything about and everything. And um, he said, I, I was sent to do his work. And then later Jesus says, what, a, what joy awaits the planter and the harvester alike. And Jesus told the disciples, um, I sent you to harvest where you did not plant. Others who've already gone before you. Uh, have done the work and now you will get to um, gather the harvest so if you think about because right now we're focusing on this nation um, many 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 people for many generations have sowed into this nation and we today even if we're not Czech we are reaping the harvest you know the blood of the martyrs are crying out right from this nation and so um, I just want us to, re to think about that as we pray for this country for Cindy and Carolyn and Leslie and others and so first of all I want to pray for ourselves that like for me I love to eat if someone if like if I had disciples and they're like here eat you know I would be happy you know I, I want to always eat but Jesus said He's hungry to do the will of the Father. So uh, whenever you get hungry, think about, you know, pray to the Lord that you'll have hunger to do the will of the Father. So let's pray for that first. Second of all, let's pray um, for those in this nation who have been sowing seeds and scattering seeds, the word of the Lord. Pray for boldness and courage for them. And then thirdly, um, let's pray for those out there, our neighbors, our co-workers, our students who are ready to receive the Lord.